Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today again. And I'm so excited because I have Dr. Simeon Hain with us. Did I say your last name right? Hi. Hi. In German, you say the last, the, the second vowel, I. Ah, okay. Long. So it's Hein, okay. Yes. So we have Simeon with us again. And of course, I had a ton of follow-up questions for him. And we're going to be addressing that today. And I know you guys have been emailing me with some questions as well. But for those folks that have not seen that original interview, and I'll have that running across the screen, um, Dr. Simeon has a, a blog called newchristalmind.com, correct, Simeon? Right, that's right, yep. So I'll have that running across as well. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, you taught statistics at university undergrads. You have a PhD in sociology, which emphasized on how humans interact with technology. You've written several books, one of which you're updating, and we're going to talk about that as well, called Black, uh, Black Swan Ghosts. And right. I fell in love with that book, and I'm actually rereading it right now again. You also appeared on the History Channel show, In Search Of, which was a great yeah. show. In 1996, you started your own research and teaching company called the Mount Baldly, in Baldly Institute. Baldly? Baldly, yeah. Baldy. Baldy, sorry. Just go. Yeah, Mount Baldy in every state. There's a Mount Baldy. This one's oh, New Mexico. Okay. Yeah. And there you teach uh, remote viewing. And that's a type of intuitive training that taps into right. our creative unconsciousness. And you also teach lectures on crop circles, which I've watched many of those. They're phenomenal. We'll have all those links for you running across the screen. And you also play guitar and write music. Yeah. <laughs> that's a nice little thing to add. So what do you play, bass or? No, I play acoustic guitar. Uh, oh, my nice. mom taught me to do alternate bass finger picking, uh, Pete oh. Seeger style, when I was a teenager in the 70s and awesome. i've been finger picking ever since then so do you post any of your music on your youtube channel or yeah i have a website openingmindsmusic.com just oh, like my cool. book uh opening minds oh all right we'll have to have that link for folks to check out as well because you yeah, know everybody's and, a music fan so yeah just like opening minds opening minds music and i there are a lot of links there you can listen for free on soundcloud uh, you can, it links right to my SoundCloud files of, of music. And I put things I'm working on. I just posted one two or three days ago as I'm writing them, I post them and, you know, until the finalized version and those end up on the CDs. So. Yeah. I haven't checked them out yet, but I will do for sure. sure, sure. So of course I want to, um, delve into Black Swan Ghosts and you, you have a little underpinning under the title that says yeah. a sociologist encounter encounters witnesses to explain aerial craft, their occupants and other elements of the multiverse. Right. So give us just a quick rundown, like a synopsis of what that book is about your thesis statement for it. Like just let folks know why you wrote the book and what we can expect to find there. No, it's, it's a good, it's a good question, Carolyn. Um, I, started learning remote viewing in 1996. And I started meeting people who came to take the classes as I found ever since getting involved RV, you're gonna have people come take your classes who've worked in the government and are just curious what remote viewing is since they probably knew about it, but it was a special access program and most people couldn't find anything out about it. So even back then at the Farsight Institute, there were people who came to take the classes who had knowledge about UFOs and cover-ups of information by the federal government. One of them had worked for NASA as a film expert transferring film from 16 millimeter film from the Apollo missions to video. He had invented and patented a device that would, back in those days, uh, would be important for taking 16 millimeter film and transferring it to video. Remember, we as these formats changed, we had to convert over to these new formats. And he told me that he had seen, looking at this NASA film footage, the archival footage, he had seen evidence of structures on the moon, big structures, destroyed structures, things that look like there had been a civilization there in the past and on the moon, uh, I mean, on uh, on the moon, 
and in the past that there might have been some sort of war there. But he described domes and broken glass windows and big structures that he could easily see in this film. And he said that there was just no doubt about it. And it was film footage that hadn't been shown to the public. So uh, he was an interesting person to talk to. And I ran into another shuttle astronaut, a civilian astronaut, as they're called, just because they've trained NASA trains more astronauts than they actually put up on uh, on their space missions. And when the shuttle was flying, um, he was one of the people that could have been one of the astronauts. And he told me about these triangular craft that the military had developed to conduct some sort of strike on our adversaries missiles. He said within half an hour, they could reach any point in the earth in half an hour. They were Mach 20 or something like this. But this astounding thing about it, Carolina, is he said they were reverse engineered from extraterrestrial technology. And he was just a very credible person. He showed me pictures of him at NASA and his spacesuits and all of this. So here were two people I just met in 96, just getting involved with RV, that told me about, you know, solid evidence that there were extraterrestrial vehicles around government reverse engineering. And it just never stopped from then. I kept meeting more witnesses. More people would tell me their stories, people who had never really talked to anyone before, uh, but wanted to share their stories. And I accumulated so many of these stories. I just felt they deserved their own book. Because what are the odds of someone like me, who's just a sociologist, going to UFO conferences just out of curiosity, not because I'm a, you know, someone that had already reached a conclusion, but just to gather information about the topic as a whole to make my mind up whether this was real or not. What what are the chance of meeting so many people with really good, credible stories, pilots, people you just who are actually in your life who might share a story of, that their dad told them from the Air Force or something like that? Uh, so what I found was that it was a very a hush hush topic. People would share their stories or their dad stories, but they weren't really comfortable doing it. And that led me to think as a sociologist that this was an important issue in terms of human experience that's not being discussed publicly. That if I'm just encountering these people and there's like 27 chapters in Black Swan Ghosts about, you know, like about 20 of them are actual witness witnesses I've encountered over the years. If I'm encountering these people and it's not like I'm putting an ad up, so, you know, contact me if you have a story. I'm just coming across these people in my life uh, and and in conferences occasionally and they're sharing stories that they really haven't shared before. It led me to believe that the this the whole UFO subject is what's what in sociology is called a hidden event, which means it's it's something that people are experiencing on a widespread scale, but for some reason they don't want to talk about it. Fear of ostracism and ridicule and perhaps some sort of uh blowback economically, uh, you know, some sort of retribution from their bosses at work for sharing stories like this, especially if they're pilots and, and so forth. So it seemed to me that this was something that was bubbling under the surface of our society and probably every country out there. But it somehow in the U.S. it was repressed that we weren't, you know, people were telling me their stories privately. And often they would tell me, Caroline, not to repeat it. It, it, it took years to write this book because I had to get permission these people didn't want to share the story. They just told me and they didn't want to repeat it. And I said, look, this everyone needs to know about. We'll change your name, but this is important. And, and it took years to get that permission to for these people to finally say, OK, um, I, I had to be tricky about it sometimes and say, you remember that story you told me that you wanted, you know, and bring it up again, because here's the thing. People forget these things after a while. They, they might not remember it years later. And they told it to you in perfect detail the first time and they'll, they'll start to forget the details. So that's why it's important just from a historical perspective. And I'm happy to say that the new edition of this book has already been accepted in Library of Congress when it's published, which I'm happy about because Library of Congress likes local history and stories that have to do with people, not just big bestsellers and hits. They want 
books that describe and, uh, and, and, and record the history of the United States. And I think from that point of view, these stories are very important because they were all told to me before we've reached a point in our society, which I think will happen at some point, where we have a more open attitude towards the subject. So it's it's almost like a forbidden topic. Absolutely. And, but but it's important because people have experienced this and they don't feel comfortable in general sharing it because they've gotten received a negative response when they've shared it in the past. Mm. So. so the new edition of this book is due out in May, you said. Yeah. Right? And yes. you've added some chapters and also gone over a lot of the material that's in there already and updated things, right? Right. Right. I, I, I've checked facts again to make sure that it's accurate and we have more information about some of these cases than we did even seven years ago when it was published in 2017. And more people have come forward to tell me their stories since then. Wow. So I thought this book really deserved a second edition, mm -hmm. especially since there have been congressional hearings about it since mm -hmm. the book was published. Uh, at the time in 2017, the only main event that had happened around it was the citizen hearing of 2013. Well, it was held at the National Press Club, which I got to attend all five days. And that was really a it was a public effort, but it was not uh, sponsored by Congress as we would have wanted it to be. It was sponsored by the by Steve Bassett and the Paradigm Research Institute. And they booked the National Press Club for five days. And they they could not get any sitting Congress people to attend. Because as you can imagine, everyone said that won't be good for my reelection prospects. They don't they didn't want to be a so it's changed since then, 2013. Yeah. You have Congress people now, Marco Rubio and others who have been very vocal about this as 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 a government accountability issue it's it's not just about whether you believe in extraterrestrials or whatever these whoever these visitors are i don't claim to exactly know who these visitors are but it's an accountability issue for our society especially if public funds are being spent on it which they are in large amounts that we have to know what does the government know about this and what are they doing about it are they doing anything? Are all these programs, black budget programs, so we never find out about it? Uh, there's just a lot of questions. I think the main uh, issue for us right now is accountability. We, we mm. in our society, we demand a level of transparency and we're right. not getting it on this topic. We're not, they're, they're pushing back the, lo the, the Arrow report from a couple months ago, completely dissed the whole subject. It, it dismissed yeah. it. And, and, and you know, inappropriately, in my view, just they, they haven't talked to the people I've talked to. Right. Uh, 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 they didn't talk to the people I've talked to because no one I've seriously had conversations about this thinks that it was just uh, a weather balloons or misidentifications of Venus or anything. Like They're talking they... about things that land and leave, you know. Right. Uh, people come out of these vehicles sometimes. That's crazy. Beans come out. That's crazy. I don't like how they contradict themselves, the government. You know, yeah. it makes me crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And it's our government. We, we're the ones that have to demand some accountability here. Uh, and it's a very challenging subject because it's going to change our view of reality in a big way. I, I, you know, a lot of people think it's probably the most important subject ever in our history. Just because it goes from us being, you know, the main intelligent species that we know of in our universe to recognizing that there's many, uh, many others, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so Could we um, touch back on the uh, moon uh, video yeah, yeah, that you, yeah. I, I'm so intrigued by that. Like w this fellow that you were talking about in the beginning of our conversation who claimed that there was all this infrastructure on the moon. Could you kind of like go into that a little bit? And um, wh where's the footage of the, is there proof of this? Like, why can't we see it today? I mean, we have amazing telescopes. Wouldn't, wouldn't they be transparent enough? Yeah, he said you could actually see this on some parts of the moon with a good telescope. You would see what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we've had other people come forward who've, uh, 
argued that there were structures found there mm -hmm. and so forth. It just appears that, you know, we haven't seen all of the all of the footage. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was all released to the public. And I think the evidence for that is in some of these astronauts testimony that they saw things on the way to the moon mm -hmm. on the way back and even you know there were there was a second nasa channel they could switch to that we weren't listening to i remember being there in 69 in that summer of 69 uh in, in one of the, the i think it was the first landing on the moon and my mom woke me up you know and i still remember seeing the black and white tv there and you could see them coming out of the the lander and so forth um there were astronauts who said that they saw evidence of this when they landed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people have overheard them talking about it at conferences and so forth. Timothy Good, in his book, Earth and Alien Enterprise, had a story about uh, an MI6 operative who had you know, retired, who had gone to one of these NASA conferences in Spain. And she had said, her name was Pamela. She had said uh, that she overheard Neil Armstrong talking about this through one of those doors in the hotels when rooms are connected together by a mm -hmm. closing door. And when she asked him about it, he said he, he couldn't talk about it. But she had heard him say to another scientist in the room that they saw other large vehicles, you know, at a distance. Um, and, um, you know, evidence of other things going on there, which they didn't share and were not allowed to share. It's just interesting because these secrets like that we're experiencing now, they, they have to be held on such a massive scale. So is everybody just afraid to come out with the truth or are they in on it? Like, I mean, I've heard, you know, I've seen so much video on fake moon landing. Like, what's your thoughts on that, too? Did that really happen? No, I think I think we really did go to the moon. I'm not going that far and saying it's all, you know, this is all conspiracy. I mean, uh, I remember talking to Edgar Mitchell at one of the conferences. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. You know, mm -hmm. Edgar Mitchell, he was a been in the Navy. He was a MIT graduate. And uh, he he was on one of the Apollo missions, early Apollo missions. And uh, he described to us what it was like to walk on the moon and look back up at the earth, see it kind of seen it above you as this little blue marble out there in space with the feeling of that, of how special it was, how precious, you know, to see the earth at that the distance and to know that's where he was from. I don't think he was making that up. I think we really did go there. Uh, I just don't think that NASA has been completely open about it. And I've made some videos about it on my YouTube channel where their own uh, their own employees have talked about seeing people whose job it was to airbrush out photos of objects that we were never seen. We were never shown. In other words, they have... Uh, they have people who they call professional strippers. Mm. They strip out things that NASA feels the public's not ready for. And there, there were people who've come for, some of them were in Steve Greer's Disclosure Project. That was another event, by the way, that happened at the National Press Club. That was in 2001. Uh, the one in 2013 uh, had 40 witnesses, by the way. I was talking about that before at the Press Club in 20, yeah, 2013. And that... Um, that was uh, an effort to bring some of the best witnesses forward to tell us what they what they knew about. Um, and one of these witnesses, um, uh, her name her name is escaping me at the moment. It'll come back to me. Uh, said that she had seen evidence of people airbrushing out uh, UFOs out of NASA photos and. Carl Wolf, who worked uh, for NRO, I believe, or one of these very classified secret organizations that does work with space-related phenomena, 
Carl Wolf, and you can watch his testimony on YouTube. Unfortunately, he was killed in a, in a biking accident a couple of years ago in New Hampshire. Uh, but he said he was in one of these facilities and one of these workers said, hey, you want to see something? We discovered a base on the moon. Jeez. And Wolf said the guy seemed really nervous, but they both took a look and there it was, you know, some really clear uh, structure. And then someone came into the room and the guy said, okay, you can't, you can't look at, you know, and they went back. But uh, is the, this, this an alien this, base or a base that we? No, it's, it's not our base. It's not our stuff. Not, not our ours. base. It doesn't seem to be. It, it, these are really large structures. I mean, I guess there's a remote possibility it was ours, but uh, Wolf didn't seem to think so because the guy said we've discovered an alien. He said we've discovered an alien base on the moon. So if, if these sort of things exist, I think the evidence. We have evidence from people that have worked with these photos and who've worked at uh, NASA. Donna Hare, that was her name. Mm. That was the woman that also discovered evidence of airbrushing out of, of oh, anomalies. Oh, I totally believe it. Do you think, yeah, so China, do you think China landed on the, the dark side of the moon or not to interrupt you, but. did Yeah, they did that recently, didn't they? They yeah. had a mission that landed. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure people have done it. I mean, we had one that went up just a couple of weeks ago that from a private company that fell on its side. And uh, th that, you know, the purpose was just to get it there, just to show that they could do it. It, 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 the solar panels needed to be facing up for it to continue to work. But no, no, I think we've landed there. I just don't think we know everything that's there because I'm told by people from the aerospace industry that NASA has a classified side. There's a black budget, NASA. We never hear about it. Mm -hmm. it. It it's understandable. It's practical. The government needs to launch satellites and things up into space, and they have NASA do it, but they don't do it in the public facilities we're used to at Cape Canaveral. They have mm -hmm. other facilities around the world, I'm told, for launching things out of view. And so, if yeah. if that would be true, and that seems reasonable to assume mm -hmm. that there's they're doing that, we could understand that that you would un. It would go along with that, that they're not sharing everything with us mm. for reasons of national security. But then it would also make sense that they're not showing everything that they found um, uh, on the moon. And so um, the when we had hearings at NASA recently about this, you know, they formed this committee. And I forget the name of the uh, I was watching these hearings about half a month, half a year ago, remember? Mm -hmm. NASA had their own little press statement about UFOs, UAP, extraterrestrial life. And they said, you know, we're going to really look at this. And folks were really serious about this. Mm -hmm. But they haven't even mentioned the people that we know about so far. Why didn't they mention Donna Hare? Right. Uh, they could mention witnesses that have come forward, very credible people that stake their entire reputations on seeing evidence of, a, of covering up the information that I think is showing that this is real. It's so sketchy. And then I, a lot of people, yeah. you know, they they don't believe we really landed on on the moon because there's documentation and proof that NASA lost a lot of the technology and footage, right? I mean, what's what's that all about? That it was erased or taped over? Some craziness is that? Yeah, we know it. Sometimes NASA has discarded some of this information, Why? And, and a lot of well, they say they need to save space and so forth. But they, they, you know, these are the photos, the original photos and footage of the moon, and oh, no, we know at times crazy. they've they they've said it's been thrown away in garbage dumpsters. We're told in garbage dumpsters for what? Why are they throwing it away? Uh, let me give you one example of mm -hmm. another type of NASA cover up. In chapter 17 in Black Swan Ghost, I talk about my uh, interaction with a guy named Dr. Richard Hoover, who is one of our planet's top uh, astrobiologists, people that study possible signs of biology from meteorites and space debris and you know things like that. And uh, he studied extremophiles. These are organisms that can live in extreme environments in the coldest parts of the Arctic, in the hottest volcanic vents, inside nuclear reactors and so forth, extremophiles. And Hoover had over 300 peer-reviewed papers on extremophiles. 
30 plus patents and he worked as NASA's top astrobiologist. And he told me at the Opening Minds, the Open Minds uh, International UFO Congress outside of Scottsdale around 2014, 2015, that he had quit over the suppression of this information from meteorites uh, that he would find if you cracked open a lot of these carbonaceous meteorites, you found evidence of fossils, fossilized life. And he said he was told by NASA, point blank, we don't want you talking about this. And he couldn't believe it. It's peer-reviewed stuff for top journals. And they repeatedly told him this and stopped, asked him to stop going to conferences and so forth. The type of censorship. Wow. No, no academic worth their salt is going to tolerate this. And he finally asked why. And they said, well, the White House doesn't like it. They feel it could, it could offend religious groups. Uh, and and he said it was the Obama White House. They felt it would affect his reelection prospects or something like this. This is way back then, uh, around 2012 or something like this, reelection mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So um, and uh, he quit over this because mm -hmm. they asked him not to talk about evidence of fossils. These are not alive anymore. These are just single celled organisms in meteorites. It wouldn't be like completely out of uh, our understanding that this could exist. Uh, the, the critique of this was that this is just contamination from lab equipment. Once you've opened mm -hmm. it, something's getting in there. Yeah, but he told me, no way. He said, he looked at it and I asked him, he said, I said, if you found this in earth fossils, would you say this is life? He goes, mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. And diatoms, these are little uh multicellular organisms that you find in the ocean. They're very interesting looking. I wish I had brought a picture of them, but um, you can look them up, diatoms. They're very kind of crystalline looking life forms. Uh, there are tons of different ones. And um, you found, he said he found diatoms and other types of fossils, which would suggest that life is sort of omnipresent throughout our universe. Mm -hmm. And NASA didn't like that message. They told him they had their own timetable for disclosing this information over decades so as not to alarm the American public. And he was going too fast for them. So he left. And uh, what was this how long ago? Well, I talked to him about 10 years ago, and he would have quit a few years before that. But is this something you ever heard about? Did anyone report on a top biologist quitting NASA? because they wouldn't let him talk about extraterrestrial fossils. It sounds just like a, a reasonable scientific debate to me. Are they fossils or not? But you I don't just completely- like that all over, like when I'm watching the History Channel or NASA Unexplained or whatever. They still they talk about that, the origins of life were brought here by, you know, meteorites and stuff. So I don't know, maybe, maybe back then it was considered taboo, but crazy. No, absolutely. It's something that we uh, we talk about. It's just amazing that modern government organizations in our society are being held back by religious fanatics. He told me in one case, his work was getting blocked from being uh, peer reviewed mm. uh, or it was being blocked from distribution within NASA. And he said when he found out who it was, it was one secretary in one department who didn't like the idea of life being outside the earth because it went against her fundamentalist religious ideas. I don't want to pick on any one religion. It's just any sort of fundamentalism that doesn't accept this. And she was the one, just one person blocking the whole thing. And he was just incensed by this. So yeah. th this is the issue is, are we going to move forward as a society and have a reasonable adult discussion <laughs> about this? Or are we going to have more Richard Hoover's? Right. Uh, I will tell you one other story that Richard told me that really was unforgettable. He was entertaining a Dr. Muradin Kumakov, who was head of the Kurchatov Institute in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, you know, we were exchanging people back and forth with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. I personally worked at one of these institutes in Austria 
called IASA, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, founded by Soviet Union and the U.S. to try to find some common ground during the Cold War so that something, something we could work on, that we could agree on, you know, to kind of create a little detente. Brezhnev and Nixon set it up. I think it was a good idea. I enjoyed working with the Soviet scientists and people from other countries. And I was working on fractal geometry and chaos theory at the time, ways of measuring things with fractals. So it was a lot of fun. And so there were these exchange programs between U.S. and Soviet Union, even back in the 70s and 80s, uh, to create, you know, kind of diffuse the tension of the Cold War. And I think it worked. Um, and the, one of these people who came over was Dr. Kumakov, who had discovered a type of uh, a type of uh, radiation. I think it was called Kumakov radiation or something like that. And he had he was head of the Kurchatov Institute, which at the time was the head of all things nuclear in the Soviet Union. They had everything nuclear in one institute, nuclear missiles, power, mm -hmm. research, everything. And this guy told Hoover over pickles and vodka one day that a UFO had come over a Soviet ICBM installation and initiated the launch sequence in 1982 in what's now Ukraine. And that it was a hundred feet across. It was hovering over the base. There are witnesses to this. You, if you watch these programs on TV, there are still people from that time period talking about it, or they were recorded when they were alive. Some of these missile launch control officers and guards, they've mm -hmm. talked about this. This is Bielo Korovich, which I haven't been able to find now because names have been changed since, since that time in, uh, in Ukraine. And anyway, this was a very serious incident. And Kumakov said it could have started World War III because the missiles were counting down to launch and they couldn't stop it. And those were missiles aimed at us here in the U.S. What? They were aimed at us and they got it started counting down and it stopped at 20 seconds to launch. He said people's hair turned gray. Who stopped it? Nobody knows. It stopped on its own. That's crazy. They couldn't stop. They lost control of it in the missile control launch center. Now, if Arrow tells us there's nothing to this, don't be, don't worry. It's all just misidentifications of meteors and flocks mm -hmm. of birds. How do you explain one of their top nuclear scientists coming over here to NASA and telling that story? He didn't have to tell that story. Yeah. He told it because he was a concerned citizen of planet Earth. You know, we looked at them as the bad guys back right. then, the Soviet Union. But at least some of them told the truth about UFOs, and Kumakov was one of them. And he told this to Hoover, and it's in it's in the book. I had Richard check the chapter personally, every word himself, <laughs> to make sure it was accurate. And so this is also a very important story from Richard Hoover, which we've heard about in the U.S. is these uh, so-called northern tier incidents, which you know about, Caroline, which were mm -hmm. so-called enemy helicopters, whatever that is, flying over Wurtsmith Air Base in Michigan, Loring in Maine, or Minot, or Maelstrom Air Force Base, where there were mm -hmm. SAC, you know, the SAC ICBMs, and having the missiles go offline. Yeah. Yes, so you we we've heard about this. Up, we kind of touched upon that in our last conversation. Yeah, and so there were some instances here where the launch sequences were initiated. And now we know it happened in the Soviet Union at the time. Mm -hmm. At the time, Ukraine was part of Soviet Union. Um, and that's led to this current conflict <laughs> where some people there believe it still should be part of Russia and the Ukrainians. They mm -hmm. no, not so fast. Right. But um, and correctly, I think, given the historical record. But the point is that there is this global phenomenon of UFOs, UAP, whatever you want to call them, tampering with missile launch control facilities mm -hmm. repeatedly. Arrow never mentioned any of this. And I know they interviewed David Shindeli, who worked at Minot, who was at the citizen hearing, by the way who had 10 of his missiles go down sequentially in 1966, very similar to what happened with Robert Salas at Maelstrom Air Force Base. 
And Shindeli told us when he showed up for work that day, he had been watching the news about UFOs over that area, over Minot, the night before. It was on the news. And people had been seeing these things around, these objects. And then he shows up at work in the morning and he's told that all his missiles are down. He talks to the people who were there at the time as they're leaving their shift. And they tell him something hovered over the missile control, you know, that each of these missile control launch facilities controls 10 missiles, which mm -hmm. are scattered around the area. And these things still exist, by the way, these launch control facilities in right. different places. Cheyenne, Wyoming, for example, still mm -hmm. controls a whole bunch that go through Wyoming, Nebraska, you know, northeast part of Colorado and so forth. By the way, that's where these drone incidents happened a few years ago. <laughs> we had these so-called mysterious drones, whatever these are. Anyway, uh, Carolyn, this, these are it's very serious cases. Shindeli oh, said he talked to Arrow. And this is on the Matt Ford Good Trouble show. I listened to this because I heard Shindeli at the citizen hearing. He was a very credible guy. And he didn't want to come forward. They told him, you're never going to talk about this. Not to your sweetie, not to your wife, nobody. It never happened. That's the title of Shindeli's book. It never happened. When the missile technician showed up the next morning, Shindeli couldn't talk to him because he had been told, you will never talk about this again. So the missile, the launch missile technician whose job it is to get the missiles online again. David Shindeli told us, it's very serious when all of your missiles go down. You have this like ranking of how the uptime for your missiles, you want sure. to keep it like towards 100%. And they all go down. It doesn't look good for your career, no, even if no. it's not your fault. You want to get them online. That's your job. And yet the technician shows up and you can't talk to him because you've been told it never happened. So this is what we're dealing with. And yeah. the fact that Arrow couldn't even get close to dealing with this, Shindeli said he talked to Arrow. I don't know who it was at Arrow. He, they had a phone conversation. He was concerned. He had been told never to talk about it again. Here are Arrow's asking him questions. Well, this is the U.S. government. you got to answer the question. So he's, is he breaking his security oath? It, well, he said it wasn't done professionally, but the questions were just ridiculous about the incident. They didn't even go as in far depth as we're going right now about it. They just asked, what did you see? Right. And then what happened? Okay, thank you very much. There was no totally perfunctory, superficial yeah. questions. You and I could have done a better job interviewing David Shindeli to find out for Arrow than they did. And he, he said he wouldn't recommend anyone talking to them. So if Arrow is going to tell us that there's just nothing to this, we just keep moving, folks, how do you explain all these nuclear tampering incidents yes. from the 60s up until the present era, right? Recently, we're told. Where I mean, this is a, this is we're talking about m missiles that have you know nuclear material in them being in you know possibility of accidental launches, and somehow that doesn't involve national security, something that Congress should be having hearings on. I don't get it. Anyway, that's why I call it Black Swan Ghost, Caroline, because it's a ghostly topic because we don't want to talk about it. And freaking Arrow just proved my point. It's a black swan event if this goes public overnight and we have incontrovertible evidence of something happening. It's going to hit our consciousness like a sledgehammer because we haven't been prepared for the Let's most part. Let's talk about real quickly, uh, as I said to you before we started this, black swan events have been yeah, yes. in the media. Just explain to folks, because I thought originally they were supposed to be like financial events, but then it kind of morphed yeah. into something else. So just go over for folks, who is Arrow and what are Black Swan events? Like, let's just quickly kind of clear that up. Yeah, so Arrow is, um, Arrow was created by the Pentagon as a successor to the UAP task force to look into the UAP phenomena. Uh, I think it's, all domain anomaly resolution office a nice sort of bureaucratic an acronym that even orwell would be proud of uh, its job was to look into this and report back to congress about its findings and you know we were all kind of hoping it would be some sort of step in the right direction at least looking about these historical cases even recent cases like the nimitz uss nimitz case you know with David Fravor and and Dietrich, uh, pilots that saw this out of their F-18s, uh, you know, 
who were sent up to look at this tic tac. I don't know how Arrow explains something going 20,000 miles an hour, an hour, excuse me, of being ordinary technology. Certainly these pilots uh, and the, the the people that manned the Princeton and Nimitz didn't think so. So they were supposed to look at it, but so far they really haven't done anything. It's just, they didn't even have a website until recently. So that it just seems like one of these sort of organizations that's designed for someone to get a kind of a get out of jail card for free type thing where they don't really have to do anything and they can keep their jobs. And it, it doesn't do what we've been talking about here. There's no risk. There's right. no risk to them to do this. They want to engage this. Congress ordered them to do something. Pentagon comes up with UAP task force, then arrow, but it's just too superficial to really look at the topic and the people involved in it. As Sean Kirkpatrick, the head of arrow said, we want to make it, SEP. SEP stands for someone else's problem. That is like, when I hear this, are you actually paying these people? Because I can't make this someone else's problem when I'm running my publishing company or teaching classes. It's got to work. Okay. You got to you have to have the class. You have to show up. You have to oh send books. Goodness. You can't make it an SEP. I can't believe the government is even proud of using that type of acronym. It's, it's just ridiculous. Uh, that anyone has a salary who believes in that as a philosophy. But this is what they do. I think you and I call it kicking the can down the road. <laughs> right? You Absolutely. just let, let it be the next. This is what we have in the U.S. We've had this in corporations and companies. And, and bad things happen when we have that attitude. We have environmental disasters. And people get injured from vehicles that don't work properly. Airplanes. Things that... Oh when they're just kicking the can down the road, right? And this is, we know what this leads to. So this is what's happened with the UFO issue. Now, the black swan ideas you're mentioning, yeah. That idea really comes more from uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, the thinker and author, a philosopher, uh, who has written a books about the danger of risk that we're not looking at because we're overly focused on bell curves bell curves that don't really describe reality. Mm -hmm. And black swan events are not things that we expect to happen. It's not like even COVID, which is sort of in our mind, you can understand a virus occasionally or a flu or something getting out of control. These are events that you don't expect ever to happen in your lifetime. And the classic example is the 2007-8 uh, economic credit crunch, mm -hmm. which happened when, uh, these credit swaps between banks that they used to insure each other started to come apart from the collapse of Lehman Brothers because they all insure each other. It's like dominoes, like a house of cards. Mm -hmm. And it led to an event where the U.S. government over one of those weekends, I think in 2008, had to lend money to about 20 banks or something. Yeah. Because they were all going to collapse on Monday morning. Yeah, you because their out. insurance yeah. is no good anymore because they're just insuring each other. It's like move, mm -hmm. musical chairs, and there's no place to sit down when the music stops. So that was an event which Wall Street had calculated, I think, as only a chance of one in ten thousand or something like this, ten thousand years. So something that might not happen for ten thousand years, where all of these banks would collapse at the same time financially because the insurance was no longer any good. So that's a black swan event. It's something that's considered to be very rare, but it happens. And I think the UFO issue is like that, just in the sense that when this sort of information really does get taken seriously, and we hear from witnesses who've experienced these phenomena for themselves, mm -hmm. it's going to have a black swan type effect on our consciousness, just because we've had so many organizations like Arrow and academic institutions, Condon Committee at the University of Colorado in the late 60s, mm -hmm. Project Blue Book from the Air Force right. in the 60s, that have all basically denied the reality of this situation and have kind of glossed over it and concluded, oh, there's nothing going on here of military significance. We just talked about all the evidence that there is. But they're not looking at it. So I consider it a type of black swan setup, but I call it a black swan ghost event because we can understand the banking system collapsing 
from kind of interlocking correlated insurance schemes that fall apart. That's sort mm -hmm. of understandable in our minds, but this is almost out of the realm of even understanding. So it'd be more of a shock. I'm not saying society is going to collapse or anything. I'm just saying, and maybe it has to happen. It, it's going to be a, a cultural and intellectual shock to realize that we already could have visitors here intermixed with our population of humans that they're already here and we don't even know they're here. They mm -hmm. look like us. They act like us. All right. They could be here in some way that we don't recognize. And maybe they don't look like the life forms that we're used to. Mm -hmm. That would be a huge existential shock to our consciousness to go from just the arrow view that we've heard recently that we don't have any evidence for it to realize they're right outside your window. Yeah. In some form that you don't have never considered. They've been here the whole time. It could have been lessened by an adult discussion of this ever since Blue Book about the reality of this. And I think J. Allen Hynek realized this was true. He was very ashamed later on of using the word swamp gas to describe mm. the Dexter, Michigan sightings. Yeah. When some reporter asked him, what do you think it was? If you read about those Dexter, Michigan sightings, these happened over a period of days and large numbers of people, including there was a school there. I think it was a girl's school. They all saw these things out the window, these objects hovering and everything. And when Heineck was asked about it at the press conference for those sightings, he said he just had to come up with something. He said swamp gas. No but he kidding. knew darn well it wasn't. And he was employed by the Air Force at this time, but he later set up his Center for UFO Studies, KUFOS, and he had people like Don Schmidt, who's written books, Witness to Roswell, mm -hmm. and other books about Roswell, uh, who worked with Heineck, who carried on the tradition of realizing there's a lot of witnesses that are out there that you don't hear from. And so we could have had this discussion for decades, and we've chose to kind of go the easy route, which is not not to engage it. Yeah. But that has led to a situation where you have a lot of witnesses who repeatedly see these things and don't talk about it. One of them, I met a woman in a cafe in Boulder. There was just a talent show that started up and a list was being passed around to sign your email. And we just happened to talk. And then she just said, out of the blue, have you ever heard about Roswell? I had not heard about Roswell except a week before the author Jim Mars, a journalist author, had just come up to Colorado from Texas, and he had written books about uh, different subjects, extraterrestrials mm -hmm. and UFOs and so forth. Uh, he actually wrote the foreword for Opening Minds, Jim, because I, I, I knew him. And I listened to his lecture on Roswell, and I actually knew something about it. So I told this person, um, I, I actually just heard a lecture about it just a weekend ago. It's quite a coincidence, you know, all the witnesses and what it could have been. And so, and she said her dad had flown the wreckage from Roswell to Wright Pat. Mm -hmm. He was one of the pilots that was kept on after World War II. Nuclear qualified pilots, you know, these, this is the bomb group 509th that dropped bombs on Japan to end World War II. Uh, or, you know, whether it was necessary or not, that's what happened. And, uh, and she told me that he would not talk about it until he was on his deathbed. Two weeks before he died, he called each daughter into his hospital room and told them one by one that he felt the family would have been threatened if he had told them mm. what he actually had seen. And what he saw were crates being brought aboard. I think it was B-29 or something like this. And there were guards that were guarding the crates from the pilots they were guarding it from nuclear qualified pilots with security clearances. So it had to be pretty special. Mm -hmm. If whatever was in there was being guarded, there were morticians at the other end at Wright Pat to receive these crates. These guards never left the crates. So it was something, you know, just for bathroom breaks, quick bathroom breaks. They flew at a very low altitude the whole way to Wright Pat because there's those those uh, areas behind the crew compartment were not pressurized. So they had to fly low enough so the guards could, yeah. 
So he wouldn't even tell them until right before he died. And he said, whatever it was, it wasn't a weather balloon, something very important because mm. it had the highest level of security. Oh, yeah. Around Be it. So this is of, the type of story. Yeah. Speaking of Roswell, you also mentioned uh, briefly about Rendlesham Forest. And yeah. I think that should should be equally as important as Roswell. Could you explain to folks what happened during that event and why is that so hush 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 as well? Yes, that is a very interesting event at a US controlled air base in the UK over Christmas 1980 where over a period of three nights, really strange objects and lights were seen around the facilities. It was a nuclear cruise missile storage facility. Again, there's that nuclear connection. Mm -hmm. The British population wasn't told that about it. They didn't know there were nuclear materials being stored there, but it was during the Cold War and there were missiles there in these bunkers. And Penniston and Burroughs, who were at the citizen hearing in 2013, were some of the security guards that were on duty that night when they saw what they believed to be an obsidian-colored triangular vehicle landed on the forest floor. And I think it was John Burroughs who went up and touched it, who felt there were hieroglyphs on the side and so forth. And he felt that he had received some sort of radiation from it or energy that had health effects on him. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, we've heard about this before from folks at Skinwalkers at the Pentagon uh, era of research, James Lukatsky's book, Skinwalker Ranch, about being exposed to some of these types of energies. And apparently Burroughs it was exposed to this. And he was being denied any health care from the VA. But from the citizen hearing, he was able to get former Congressman Merrill Cook and others to contact the VA and get medical assistance for this. So the whole Bentwaters uh, incident, you know, is just strange because you have a lot of witnesses who saw what was happening. And uh, we never really had a good explanation for what it was, especially since it happened over a couple nights. And um, it's just a very important event in, in UFO history. What actually did they see out there in the forest? There have been these counter explanations, which were not really satisfactory. But didn't oh, he well. have a recorder and he actually recorded because uh, there were no video. That was Colonel Halt. And Colonel Halt, uh, Colonel Halt uh, did record what he was seeing. Mm -hmm. it, it was an object moving around at tree level through the trees, right. a brightly lit object that looked like a big eye in the sky at tree level moving around. So you have this evidence from the case. And again, we're talking about, you know, an important military base, military policeman experience in this recording mm -hmm. this. A lot of people will be involved, lights being set up to try to find out what this was. Unfortunately, one of the authors of these books, it was later found, had fabricated it, which is what makes it a little complex, is we learned about this a lot from one of the main books written about it. And we later so, man, found- what did he fabricate? What exactly did he fabricate? Uh, I don't want to mention any names because, uh, you know, I'm happy to tell people off air, but one of the main books written about it is later considered to have been fictitious. Jeez. Not all of them, not Colonel Halt. And actually Colonel Halt criticized this person. I was at the UFO Congress and he criticized this book. And I thought, what's he talking about? Mm. And Halt came forward and said, no, this is fictitious. It turned out to be true. It doesn't mean the event didn't happen. We have a lot of witnesses. It just mean one of the witnesses who was there, they heard the stories. They were there at the time. They might have experienced it, but there's too much of in doubt now about oh. this particular. But it doesn't affect the other persons. We have so many different witnesses. Yeah. It means their criticisms of this person were correct. And it's very hard to know in the UFO field sometimes if this is happening, but it they, they were criticizing this person from the beginning and it just turns out they're correct. It doesn't mean the whole thing didn't happen. It just means one of the people there 
took liberties with their book and and extended it. We can't. We don't know exactly what he was talking about. Um, but, um, uh, but that is one very important event where you know you had a lot of evidence. You had sightings of a craft on the ground. That mm -hmm. that is not in question, and they were willing to testify at the citizen hearing that this happened, and that. Um, again, it's another event where there was a cover up about it. We weren't really, you know, ever really told about what that could have been. But the feeling yeah. of Penniston and Burroughs is we might have been dealing with. I think Burroughs said he got the feeling it was some sort of time travelers or something. I mean, something really strange. Yeah. You see an object like that and uh, to, to feel like you got some sort of mental download. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the. There were beams of energy fired at the bunkers with missiles in there. <clears throat> it just sounds like these other cases. We've heard descriptions of these UAP UFOs mm -hmm. tampering with these missiles, just like we've right. heard we were talking about. And I believe one, I asked someone about the citizen hearing. I think it might have been Penniston or Burroughs. Uh, I think they said the evidence is that the missiles were adversely affected by these energy beams. This would be a reason, again, why we didn't hear about it. It looks like another ET tampering, uh, messing around with our nukes incident, uh, which, I mean, just fits a pattern here. And th this, you know, Caroline, this could just be, if the Congress wanted one thing to focus on, if they weren't so concerned about reelection, this could be just one thing that they could focus on is, military service personnel that have experienced this missile tampering mm. during UAP events. And what does it mean? Uh, what's the significance of this, given that it's happened to missile systems across the planet in different countries? Um, you also touch upon ESP yeah. in your book um, and that the data, I guess, goes back at least a hundred years. Uh, we've had so many experiments done some credible some not what are your thoughts on just esp and also i've been reading a lot about our pineal gland and how the fluoride in the drinking water calcifies it which stops us from having esp experiences telepathic experiences what's your whole thought on that whole topic right well i've been involved with what's called remote viewing since the late 90s and uh, mid late nineties and no, no, this is another area where there's a lot of evidence, lots of studies. Um, it, people have felt in the past that it wasn't easy to explain or understand. But I think when we look at a range of so-called paranormal phenomena, people often report these types of RV experiences in and around these phenomena. Um, even Jacques Vallée has talked about this, uh, the researcher that people who experience ufos sometimes get rv type mm -hmm. uh, feelings of knowing things before the event happens after the event um th this has been known to happen around orbs ball lightning and so forth where people feel they pick up psychic abilities so what it suggests to me is that teaching rv working with people right now or you know couple decades space time is more malleable than it looks the way we're trained as modern people is not to believe in such things and to focus on more rational ways of living our lives mm -hmm. but there is evidence that there are these sort of uh, subtler indirect methods of gaining information where it's just instantaneously available to you without any external technology which suggests that we're connected to a continuous space-time field of energy information. And it, it it's not that hard to access it. We're pretty much focused on our conscious minds during our waking hours because we're all busy people and have scheduled have to do things and it's totally understandable. But there are these other subterranean, what seem like subterranean pathways of information. And RV shows us that's true. This was a government program also as a, a military program against during the Cold War against Soviet and Chinese psychotronic uh, research programs where they were developing psychics for 
a type of, you know, espionage or even military applications. Um, and so our government here in the U.S. had their own program for 20 years, both, you know, mainly focused at SRI, but also at Fort Meade. SRI in Palo Alto to develop psychics who could, you know, use this in some sort of strategic way. And what we found is that the average person has this ability. And, and we all get this from time to time when we get intuitive feelings about things and people and events without, you know, having a formal way of actually knowing if that's true. It often happens to do with people in our lives. It's a type of resonance. And a lot of these subjects have to do with resonance and various types of exotic quantum effects that allow distant spaces to communicate or connect together through resonance. So it's part and parcel of this sort of topic. Even what we've heard of is cold fusion, what's referred to now low energy nuclear reaction, Fleischmann and Pons at the University of Utah in 89. That is a resonance reaction. It's not chemicals. It's not heating things up to high temperatures. It's a type of resonance where the atomic components interact in very interesting ways out of the ordinary ways but in a compressed uh, kind of physical medium where they begin to resonate together and release a lot of energy from the resonance process. And you get a very strong attractive force that takes over. So it seems to me that all the way from remote viewing to cold fusion, we can find this underlying theme of resonance and physics properties, something called the Aronhoff bohm effect, where you actually get physical consequences of this. It's not just something you're imagining or thinking about. You can measure it. It seems to pervade, Caroline, to me, all of these phenomena. We were talking about cryptids last time all the way to UFOs, you get a range of phenomena in all of these types of situations. Just one example, you get temperature changes. You often get these temperature drops around these phenomena, which I think indicates to us we're dealing with a sort of common process here. The mm -hmm. fact that all the way from things like ghosts to UFOs to Bigfoot, people often report right. the temperature dropping. Yep. As a scientist, to me, that's a clue that there's a fundamental commonality to what we call paranormal phenomena. Right. They're not all as separate as it looks, or you wouldn't get some of, you get batteries and cameras failing, temperature drops. You, you know what I'm talking about. You get these same sort of symptoms repeating blurriness mm -hmm. when you try to take photos of these things. You get these same sort of uh, uh, characteristics repeating themselves across these different phenomena, which makes it very interesting and shows us this is actually science. Right. Why our society has been so resistant to want to look into it, given that it could have, you know, really beneficial uh, impacts on energy and how we relate to nature and technology. We should we should be developing these technologies. Absolutely, but it would met, cause us to admit that these craft are real to right. these UFOs and whoever these ETs are. I don't know actually who these are, but um, they come out sometimes. They communicate. They can communicate telepathically to people. Uh, one of the witnesses in my book encountered one of these beans uh, on a hill in Surrey, England. He just couldn't believe it, but he had seen UFOs as a kid and he thought they were probably real. And his friend panicked and the thing turned around. It was about six feet tall and kind of a skin tight suit and walked back into the craft and left. And he later got calls within a day from some organization that wouldn't identify them themselves, wanting to know all the details. They, they wanted every blade of grass, he said, every little detail which mm -hmm. led him to believe that they knew more than we've been left. Yeah. And this is back in the seventies, back in the seventies. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've even seen video of people that can step outside and connect with these UAPs through like a vibratory thing and they can yeah. communicate and call them into presence. Like, and they have it on video, whether, you know, but it's sad that everything gets classified as woo woo science, you know, like, it's sad because I think a lot of it, it has a lot of validity. Now, you also had an experience as well, right? I did. No, thanks for remembering that. When I was in the Everglades with my mom in the 70s, we saw something that I thought was the moon overhead, but it was amorphous green. It was weird. 
Mm. And it had dot, we had binoculars. And when we looked at it with binoculars, there was a pattern of like a Z with dots, but lined up. So I thought, well, it's not a cloud. Clouds don't have perfect dots, a perfectly round cloud. That's what my mind was thinking, or the moon or something. Well, the moon was on the horizon and it moved as soon as we started looking at it, went from stationary to right into a cloud. So I did have that sighting. I the, the ranger at the ranger talk that night didn't even want to talk about it when my mom raised her hand to say what people had seen that day. The ranger thought it'd be like birds and things. And it's a, you know, oh. and animals. And my mom said, no, we saw you. UFO. I have another case like that, though. I just wanted to conclude with this. Uh, the reason I'm partly revising Black Swan Ghosts is there was a sighting in my high school class over one of the neighboring school's gyms at Mamaroneck High School in New York. And I didn't hear about it until a couple of years ago, but it happened in 1979. Wow. And this is how suppressed these events are. Mm -hmm. The wrestling team saw this coming out of Mamaroneck High School wrestling uh, match on a Saturday, a black, big black triangle hovering about a mile over the gym and jets came out of the direction of Connecticut and chased it away. And one of my friends, Dominic from high school did research on this and found the microfiche news articles from that week in 1979 or a week later. And it totally corroborated what Vinny, the wrestling coach told me. I have those interviews on my YouTube channel, by the way, with coach Vinny, the wrestling coach at the time. But it corroborated. There were other witnesses to seeing this triangle. It had lights on the tips. Uh, there was some disagreement about what types of planes they were. But um, it was chased away by aircraft. And Vinny said it moved like the Starship Enterprise uh, wow. in warp speed. I mean, just sort of like my object in the Everglades. But I mean, really, like from nothing to... And so um, it's just another example. It's This is something that happened to your high school classmates. Mm. And they didn't talk about it. One of the kids on the wrestling team who was my age, who I knew from high school, said it was the scariest thing he'd ever seen. And that's why nobody talked about it. So you have to wonder how many else, how many other people are out there with stories yeah. like this. Yeah. And this is why people like me write books about it. So you start to see a pattern. It's happened right to people from your high school class at your high school while right. you were there. And they didn't tell you the next day. And you find out about it 40 years later. And all of the people in the book who've told me their stories, it's it's like that. The, the dads did not want to share the stories from Roswell or the Air Force stories. A lot of these people have been told never to talk about it again, quite seriously. And so that's the situation we're in. Everyone's been told not to talk about it. And people have been threatened or signed They've signed agreements with the federal government not to talk about it right. in their line of work. So we have this over compartmentalization. We all realize there needs to be secrecy around certain topics, no doubt about it. But if it goes too far in that direction, you don't have any democracy left because that's there's correct. nothing to talk about. And that's where we're at right now is we have to open it up so that people start to talk to each other and we can sort of maybe develop a sense of what's going on. What are these objects? Who are these beings? What's their motivations? What are they doing here? Mm. Uh, what's their relationship to us? Are they the inhabitants of the planet? Did we did we show right. up later? Are yeah. they the real inhabitants and they just consider us like ants so we're not even worth talking to? I don't know. But these are all real possibilities. I would just like to see Congress talking about it more openly. Not They've had classified hearings, which is fine, but I would like to see public discussion. And it's... Here's what I think about it, Carolyn, in the final analysis. When I grew up, there was a show called Star Trek mm. on TV. And my little mind at five years old, we started watching, I believe, in 68 on a black and white TV. I still remember sitting there with my brother watching Star Trek. Me too. It, it, it was a catalyst for uh, creating curiosity in my young mind about space in the universe and it was a positive catalyst because all those scenarios they showed on star trek you always wondered would aliens really be like that 
Would they be like Spock? Would they be like some of the the beautiful aliens they encountered in those episodes with Kirk and Spock there doing their macho thing? But what would they be like? And I think that curiosity has stayed with me ever since. And I think it's motivated a lot of people to, it's motivated people at NASA. We've heard there were, when that show went off the air a number of years ago, there was a petition at NASA to bring it back on. And it, it came wow. back on. It wow. showed up again in these various uh, versions that we have now. Uh, yeah, that... so many of them. Yeah, so I think it's important just for the sake of our imaginations and for knowledge to have a discussion about it because it gives people a sense of wonder and amazement. It does. And that sense of wonder and amazement can sustain you through bad days, yeah. tough days that we all have from time to time. It can keep you going because you know there's something bigger. Right. And I like that perspective. It sort of humbles you and it makes you realize there's something really big going on out there. And I think it's our right to know that we're a part of that. And that's my why I think we need to have disclosure and open discussion about it. That, that was so brilliantly said. I love that. Oh, thank you. Um. I'm going to start reading now another book that you authored, Opening Minds. Yes. And I also want to read Dark Matter Months. Can you show the other books, that the Dark Matter Yeah, ones? so Dark this Matter is my Monster. first book in 2002. I am happy to say I wouldn't change a word of it. It's all nice. about how nature and fractal geometry and energy works, my experience with crop circles and remote viewing, and it's full of pictures I put this to book together myself. It was painstaking. And I still am very proud of showing what remote viewing looks like and these beautiful crop circles and so forth, our experiences in the crops. So that's opening minds and um, dark matter monsters. I actually have received since our last interview, the hardcover version. Oh, nice. In teaching remote viewing, there were Bigfoot witnesses in my classes in Colorado, several of them. And I started looking into it, just sort of like the other topics. Thinking, really? Seriously? Yeah. And they were all, I couldn't believe the types of encounters people have had all over the U.S., North America, and the world. Mm -hmm. And the strange relationship between the things people see around Bigfoot orbs and crop circles. Caroline, I never would have imagined there was a crop circle Bigfoot connection. There is. No I'm not word. saying they, they make them. They're orbs seen around both of these things. So uh, finding the connections between these topics is fascinating. That's why I continue to, to write uh, books. And I'm very proud of this one, too, Dark Matter Monsters, because uh, you what you get, by the way, with the hardcover is color pictures. Nice. It's expensive on Amazon, but I, it's actually the paper is a, I have one copy. The paper is very good quality and the pictures look nice in, uh, you know, in color. Oh, yeah. Versus the soft your cover. Lecture, your lecture on Bigfoot that you posted to YouTube. That was great. Oh, that was one I did near where I went to graduate school at Troy, Idaho. It was, a, as you can see in that uh lecture that was a very good audience because those people had experience with the creatures ah out in where people in rural areas experience this more than urban people and they're a little more clued into bigfoot being a real thing versus urban people like me who grew up on the east coast just thinking it was some sort of fiction right uh you realize when you start talking to witnesses it's real it may be rare but it's real and uh yeah so that was a lot of fun giving a lecture to those uh, that group it's always such a pleasure speaking with you. And I mean, I'm going to reach out to you again as soon as I'm done with sure. it, because I, again, have so many more questions for you. And you have such a a brilliant way of explaining things so that, we, you know, regular folks like me can understand. It makes so much sense. But I'm going to have all your links, of course, running across the screen as well as in the description so folks can reach out to you and I thank you so much. And of course, I'll be in touch with you again soon. Did you okay, thanks very much. And oh. uh, any anyone out there, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Simeon. We'll speak to you again soon. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep.